I'm going to start off by reading our scriptures this morning. In um, part, part of the first one, um, we touched on a little bit recently, and the last one that we'll read, we read completely, talked about it briefly, but we're going to talk about it even deeper today. So, see if you recognize some of this from from before. First scripture comes from Second Timothy chapter one, verses one through seven. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. It's kind of the introduction to the letter. Dear Tim, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. Now this should, next one should sound familiar. Which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, and then your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is also in you. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Isn't that great? I love that. That last verse is so wonderful. Now, here's here's a verse we touched on before. We're really going to dig into it today. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 7 says, God formed man out of the most beautiful diamonds the earth had ever created. Nope. God formed man out of the dirt from the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The man came alive, a living soul. Wow. God, we pray that as we begin to discuss your word. We pray that you would keep the speaker out of your way, that that we would hear the message that you have for us. Help us, Father, to allow the distractions of everyday life to just kind of melt away as we just kind of lean in to you as we fellowship and learn together. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have a question I'm wondering, by show of hands, how many of you grew up in church? Like, since you were a little kid, you were going to church, and it just kind of stuck with you ever since. A lot of us. Okay, good. Because that means that you understand, because you were a church kid, there are certain struggles and life experiences that non-church kids just don't understand when you talk about it, right? For example, when I was a kid, and I know this is foreign to our current culture, but when I was a kid, going to church, not optional, right? Going to church was not optional. If you were breathing and had a pulse, your toddler tail was getting up, getting dressed, going to Sunday school, then to church, then you're coming back Sunday night to evening church, then you're also going back on Wednesday for midweek worship, and it was not optional. Now, when you hit your teenage years, you get a little brave and a little bold because I think it's about 15, 16, it it clicks and you realize, wow, I know everything. That's awesome. Now, that's to say that when I became a teenager, I decided one time, only one time, to test this church is not optional theory. I got mad at my dad, and I said, one Sunday morning, I said, Dad, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I might as well stay here and sleep where it's more comfortable, those pews are hard, and church is boring. And this is another one of those times where Dad would reach down and just kind of put his thumb on his belt buckle, and I, everybody knows, you, do, you don't want to see that lasso come out, right? <laughs> but he said, he, he kind of, took two steps into my room, and in the back of my mind I heard, 
like he was a gunfighter stepping into my room. And he said, son, you have two options. One, you can get up, get dressed, and we'll go to church. Or two, I can kill you, we'll go to church and have your funeral. But either way, we're going to church because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I grew up in church like many of you. I was even on, yes, I was a geek. I was even on the Bible quiz team. Are you familiar with that? Where they have the little the chairs and then they have a little pad on the chair and they start off with the first couple of words of the verse or they give you the address and you, the first one to stand up. Gets, gets a point or whatever. So, But it was during those contests, they would always ask, what is your favorite Bible verse? But you know what they never asked? What is your least favorite Bible verse? Not once did they ask, what is your least favorite Bible verse? Who has one? Have you ever even, does anybody have a verse where you just, you think about it and it just kind of makes you uncomfortable? If not, I would encourage you to find one. Because sometimes it's those verses that make you uncomfortable that when, when you process it and you work through it and you ask questions and you, you work your way through it between you and God, that's where some real deep healing can come. But, um, where was I? Oh, yes. Um, my, my verse we already read. I think we've already talked about that briefly. It's Genesis 2, 7 that tells us that God created man out of the very dirt of the earth. Now, doesn't that just bless your argyle socks right off your feet? I think if you're ever tempted to be saved and stuck up, anointed and arrogant, if you ever start feeling like you're all that and a Kit Kat, you need to stop, take a step backwards, and read this verse for yourself because nothing can knock you off your holy high throne of self-importance like God reminding you you came from dirt so if we pause right now and you just take a moment and everybody look at the people on your left side of the sanctuary now look at the people on the right side of the sanctuary look at the people in front of you and behind you just look around at all the faces Every single person you just looked at, according to the Word of God, every single one of them is a dirt bag. <laughs> Don't let the, the, the cool clothes and the fancy hair fool you. We were all created from the dirt or the dust of the earth. And what I think is so absolutely hilarious about this is all the things that we do to our dirt. Right? We get up, especially on Sunday morning, we put, on our, we put a, our best shirt on our dirt. Right? You put deodorant. I, I hope you put deodorant on your dirt. Ladies, you spend a lot of money on your dirt. You take your dirt to the spa. You get your spa manicured. You get your, you get your dirt manicured and pedicured. And billions of dollars are spent each year around the world on dirt surgery. You can get dirt suction, a dirt lift, a dirt tuck. You can Botox your dirt. Some of us aren't happy with the color of our dirt, so we fake tan our dirt. Some of us put skinny jeans on our dirt. Some of us are too old to do that anymore. Some of us tattoo our dirt or we pierce our dirt. We take selfies with our dirt and then post it on Instagram or Facebook. But let's be honest, it's never the first picture you take, is it? It's maybe the seventh or eighth because you've got to take it from up here because it makes you look thinner, or so I'm told. And apparently you're supposed to do something like duck face. I don't know. It seems like everybody does that. But it's never the first one. You take the, you get, you know, adjust the filter, kind of try to edit out the love handles a bit if you can. You know, do that one thing where it cleans up your wrinkles, right? Get it just right. Then you post it on Instagram and Facebook, hashtag selfie. But it's not hashtag selfie, it's hashtag dirty because we all were made from dirt. And I'm not trying to be offensive, I'm trying to be informative. See, listen, this is you. <laughs> 
Now this is where it gets uncomfortable, right? See, if the substance of something speaks to its significance, if the substance of something speaks to its significance, then I have a problem with this verse. Right? Because it says we came from dirt. And this used to really, really get under my skin, especially when I would contrast this with what I knew about the greatness and the magnificence and the perfection of God Almighty. Because our God doesn't do anything ordinary. Everything that God does is extraordinary. Our God does everything with awe and wonder and magnificence. He doesn't do anything halfway. All you have to do is look at a summer sunset and you know what a perfect artist God really is. And everything God does is beautiful and luxurious and stunning. Just, just think about heaven. I can promise you, I assure you, there will never be an extreme makeover heaven edition. Not going to happen. Because God is perfect and God is the maker, the architect, the designer of heaven. Heaven is perfect. He paved the streets with gold. The gates of heaven inlaid with perfect pearls. Amazing. But when it came to creating you and me, he looked around at all the different possibilities and he chose dirt. Is that confusing? Anyone else? For the streets that we're going to walk on in heaven, gold. For the very people that he sent his son to die on a cross for, dirt. Dirt. God created man from the dirt of the ground. Not exactly an ego booster, is it? So can you see why this wasn't exactly my favorite verse for years and years and years? For years, I was absolutely puzzled over this whole dirt dilemma. Until finally, God gave me a creation revelation. I think He finally... Well, that's not the way to say that. I think He... He acknowledged my frustration and he kind of made me realize that I was seeing his creation kind of upside down. God revealed to me that day and he's saying to you today that we should be jumping up and down and shouting for joy and praising God because yes, God is perfect and he is holy, but he's not afraid to work with things or people who are dirty. You serve a God who is awesome, and yet He works with things that are awful. You serve a God who is extraordinary, and yet He works with people who are quite ordinary. I just want us to pause for just a moment and thank God. Thank God that when everyone else is saying, no, 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 you get that dirty, messed up person away from me. Can't take it, can't deal with it. Get them away from me. God himself says, no, bring me that mess. Bring me the dirt. And that dirt that you think is messed up, that person that you think is beyond repair, that marriage that you think is beyond healing, that leader who just won't lead, that deacon who just won't deek, <laughs> the city that seems beyond help. God himself. In his perfection, he says, bring it to me. And I will put my hands on that dirt. And I will shape that dirt. And I will heal that dirt. As a matter of fact, he says, I will breathe new life into that dirt. And that dirt will come alive again in Jesus' name. And you should be excited. Is there anyone here that is thankful that God can work with dirt? So you can't have this attitude of superiority and think you're all that in a Kit Kat and then thank God for that. But if you're willing to be honest with yourself about yourself 
Now, come on. You know you have some issues. Some of your issues have issues. <laughs> we should thank God that he works with dirt. That God doesn't need perfect, pristine, Pinterest perfect people to get the glory out of your story. As a matter of fact, we said before, God can take a great mess and turn it into greatness. Because when God works with someone who is messed up, who is struggling, who keeps failing over and over again, when God works with that kind of a person, only God can get the glory when that story changes. Aren't you thankful that God can work with dirty, messed up, struggling people? People with issues, addictions, inconsistencies, dysfunctions. God said, I can work with that dirt. Aren't you glad? Now here, here's the next level of that as we go a little bit deeper. It's very important for us to remember that dirt is the only environment that is conducive to growing a seed. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but you could not plant a seed in a jar of gold or silver and have it grow. You could not plant a seed in the most beautiful diamonds that the earth has. Unless the seed is placed in the dirt, it'll never reach maximum potential. Now, let me bring this to your front door. I suggest to you that although you came from dirt, there is a seed planted inside of you. And that seed is a gift from God. There is a gift inside of you, and God is simply waiting for you to stir that gift up. He's waiting for you to awaken to the wonder of what He has put inside of you. Maybe this is why God says we have these treasures in earthen vessels. Remember that? He says, Christ that is in us that is the hope of glory. Because there is a gift inside of you. And it's really important that, that you know that you can accept this following reality. Your family, your close friends, many of them are waiting for you. They're waiting for you to stir up that gift that God has planted in you. They already see something you've not yet recognized. And they're just waiting for you to stir the gift and awaken to the wonder. I absolutely love our text for today because it's Paul who's writing to his spiritual son, Timothy. And Paul is highlighting the importance of doing just that, stirring the gift that God has placed inside of him. And I love that it's Paul that is writing this text because if there's one person who could tell another person, stir the gift that God has planted inside of you, it would be Paul. Uh, in other words, he was what we might call, respectfully, a first century stud. <laughs> He had awakened them to the gift that God had planted inside of himself. And so now he was hyper-spreading the good news, hoping, praying, believing that they would also awaken to the gift that God had planted inside of them. Does it make sense now why the officials and the leaders so desperately wanted to arrest Paul, and eventually they wanted to kill Paul because he was so effective at awakening people to the wonder of what God had placed inside of him. They wanted to kill him. He was so effective. But if you remember the character of Paul, these prison guards and the officials, they said, Paul, we're going to kill you. He said, all right, that's cool. To die is gain. All right then, Paul, we're going to let you live. Oh, cool. To live is Christ. Okay then, we're going to make you suffer. Here's what he said. That's cool too. I made that part up. That's cool too because I reckon that these present sufferings 
are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed, where? On the inside of me. These present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed inside of me. Paul was a hyperactive, undiagnosed ADHD lover of Jesus Christ. If Paul was alive today, you'd be getting text messages, messengers, Facebook, all these different communications from Paul. He was Christianity's first marketing ninja warrior. <laughs> I'm telling you, he knew how to get the good news out to the not-so-good parts of town. And as impressive as all that is, you can't really appreciate the text unless you, t again, take a step back and consider the subtext, or the context, rather. Remember what we always say about context. A text without context is just a pretext to whatever you want it to mean. So context is really important, especially here. Uh, and here's why. We're looking at 2 Timothy, right? Many, if not most, biblical scholars believe that 2 Timothy is the very last thing that Paul wrote. Say, well, why is that important? It's important because that means that Paul is writing this impassioned, stir the gift inside of you letter from death row. And if there's one thing we know, it's that having a conscious awareness of your mortality, having a conscious awareness of death will quickly crystallize what's really important to you in your life. I mean, think about all the different things that Paul could have said in those last moments of his life. But what he writes is stir up what God put inside of you. That's what he said. Now, I'm, I'm just going to confess my weakness. I'm telling you right now, if it were me on death row, what am I going to write? Get me the key and help me flee. Bake me a cake with a file in it, something. Get me out of here. My focus, sadly, would be on me. But not Paul. Paul feels this urgent, deep-seated desire this impassioned calling to communicate the significance, how important it really is. Whatever you do, stir that gift that God has put inside of you. Why? Why do you think Paul was so very passionate and, and, and really wanted people to know how important this was? Because Paul, knowing he could be facing death, he knew that ultimately... It's all that really matters. He knew the ultimate life question is what did you do with, God, with what God planted inside of you? What did you do with what God planted inside of you? So believe it or not, when you get to heaven, God is not going to ask, what did you do with that three-bedroom, two-bath, two-car garage on the lake that I gave you? He's not going to ask when you get to heaven, uh, what denomination were you, please? How many Bible verses did you memorize while you were on earth? Oh, by the way, did you, did you raise your hand when they sang Amazing Grace? And listen, this one may shock you, but when we get to heaven, God is not going to ask us if we were Democrat or Republican. Just saying. But he is going to ask you, what did you do with that gift that I placed inside of you? What did you do with that dream I put inside of you? What did you do with that passion that I put inside of you? Did you stir up that gift that I put inside you? Are you breathing out what I breathed into you before the dawn of time? And I know, I know it's the year 2022 and it's a scary, dangerous, frightful world out there right now. When you look at the world and the state that it's in right now, there are so many things that we could be worried about. But let me tell you what I'm most afraid of. I am most afraid of getting to heaven 
And God has two screens set up. And on one screen, He shows me all the things that I did for God. And on the other screen, He shows me all the things that I could have done for Him. If, if I had just stirred the gift, awakened the wonder, and lived into that which He had placed within me. See, the tragedy of life is not death. It's the things that we allow to die in us while we're still alive. Let me close with this quote by Michael Iaconelli. What a name. (laughs) Michael Iaconelli. I wonder if he had any nicknames in high school. But he wrote an amazing book, and if you'd like to borrow my copy, you're more than welcome. It's called... um, Dangerous wonder. Here's what he says. It took me 50 years to realize I was lost. No one knew I was lost. My life had all the trappings of foundness. I was a pastor for heaven's sake. I had succeeded at mimicking aliveness, but I was nearly dead. I wonder if any of us have perfected the fine art of mimicking aliveness to the point where we've actually kind of started to fool ourselves even. It can be so easy to look at our own life and all we can see because of it's been ingrained into our mind by other people over the years as we were young and as we got older and all we can see when we look at our own lives is the dirt. Because for some of us, that's all anyone else ever highlighted for us. Sometimes it can get to the point where we just get to it, but we go, I just can't, I can't handle it anymore. I just can't handle it. Do you know why you feel that way? Do you know why most of us can't handle it? Because we're trying to handle it. I can't handle it because I'm trying to handle it. And we were never created to handle everything life hands us alone without His help. I just want to lovingly encourage you. Take all your worries, your anxieties, your fears. I want to make sure you know that I know those are very real. It's not some mystery. They're very real, painful life struggles. And I just want to loving lovingly encourage you to take all of those and place them into God's hands. He'll never let you down, I promise you. You say, God, I give you my life, I give you my dirt, because I know you can do something miraculous, something mighty with with the brokenness that is me. When you put all that is you into his hands, that's when miraculous things start to develop. That's when God begins to build masterpieces out of what was once dirt. Our Father in heaven, we we want to pause for just a moment and have, have a few moments of silent prayer to seize this moment, to communicate with you Please hear our prayers. Father, we thank you that You never really saw dirt when it came to us. You saw the finished product, the masterpiece, before we were even born. We humbly 
plead with you to help us live in to that destiny that you've created for us. Help us to become the masterpieces you created us to be. Thank you for being so patient with us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.